So in the context of uh, systems neuroscience, I would say a central challenge is really whether we can use the properties of the cells that we understand, try to link uh, the different levels of understanding from the uh, cellular molecular uh, neuroscience to the level of uh, behavioral systems neuroscience. That is the major challenge. So in the next few minutes, I would like to uh, show you or introduce to you a sample project that I've been uh, recently working on, uh, trying to uh, address this problem from multiple different uh, levels. So um, in the place where I've been worked, uh, just like Dr. Pa uh, Panos um, described in the, mentioned in the beginning, it's called Genelia. And in the building, there are a whole way it looks like this in the east side of the building. And on the west side of building, there's another hallway, which looks like this. So that looks nearly identical, except with the one critical difference. That is the uh, arrangement of the uh, restroom behind the walls with, the, with their assignment of the gender exactly the opposite. So when I started to work in uh, this place, I made a few uh, very serious mistakes. And then I realized I really have to learn to perform, to, to, to do some sort of context dependent navigation. So what does context dependence mean? It means I probably, before I start to go to the restroom, try to use the, go walk into the hallway, I probably have to remember where I just come from, or I probably have to recognize some sort of visual cues, like a plate or small, uh, small sign in front of the hallway in order to, for me to understand where I, exactly I am in, and then how to get to the restroom I'm going, I, I need to get to. So the, 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 the big problem of the overall uh, uh, project is what kinds of cellular mechanism can support this sort of context dependent spatial navigation and what underlies the learning component. So we can realize the path that I described into a behavioral paradigm for mouse like this. So the mouse is um, trained to run in this wide shape uh, environment and it has to recognize the initial part of the maze with the different cues on two sides of the walls. And then it walks through this uh, delay region, around through this delay region where there's no differential cues, and then turn left or turn right to collect the rewards depending on what the initial cues are. So you have, always have to turn to the direction where there is a vertical walls on the side of the wall, uh, uh, vertical stripes on the uh, one side of the wall. And uh, we chose to implement the task either mouse virtual reality so pretty so basically the mouse was fixed with some implant on the head and it's running on a spherical treadmill and the rotation of the spherical styrofoam ball is coupled to the visual scene display in front of the mouse in the monitors which simulate uh, uh, uh some someone walking in a, uh, a virtual reality yeah it's, it's just like a mouse playing video games like a uh rpg okay and then this is what, and also the very important point of this uh, task really is when a mouse walks through the initial part of the maze and, and into the delay region, essentially look at the same uh, visual scenes in front of it, right? So, so to speak, the mouse is at the same position in the, in the maze, but with different behavioral contexts, because in one context has to turn left to collect the reward. Another, the other context has to turn right to the reward. So it has the same spatial position, but different contexts. And the brain should have, shall have some sort of context dependent spatial coding uh, of the information to facilitate this process. So this is what the actual uh, maze looks like. So the mouse is here and it's running on the treadmill uh, below it. And then you can see the visual scene is displayed in the monitors. And it can recognize the initial cues, like here, the vertical stripes in the right-hand side. So you have to turn to the right uh, in the choice arm in order to collect the rewards. So that's very uh, useful for us to, to, to implement, to use the virtual reality, because we can very precise and strictly uh, control the uh, visual cues delivered to the mouse so difference of the neural signal cannot be simply explained by difference of the sensory input, but probably more about the context. But more importantly, we, it allowed us to put a small, tiny, small glass electrode into the mouse brain to recall input and output of the neuron, and therefore to infer the computation that performed by the neurons uh, when the mouse plays it, uh, perform this relatively complex uh, task. And um, I am particularly interested in a brain region 
called the hippocampus. Uh, when they see it's blocking. Okay, anyway, I'm particularly interested in the brain region called the hippocampus. The hippocampus has been known to be very important for both the spatial navigation and the memory. And these two aspects have been considered might be close, closely related because you can conceptual, you can think of the uh, memory as a form of abstract spatial, uh, abstract navigation in a mental space. So the idea of hippocampus as a spatial navigation system was born out of the discovery of place cell in the 1970s. Uh, so here you see an uh, example recording from a fully moving rat with the electrode implement to the dorsal hippocampus. And the trajectory, a gray trace is the trajectory of animals moving. It's a kind of uh, fun, funny because it's a speed up video. And then you can see each red dot is a firing of one action potential from a particular play, uh, cell recorded by the electrode. And then you can see as the time passed by, there are more and more red dots accumulate in a particular uh, quadrant, a particular corner of the space. And if we accumulate all the points and plot it in, into a heat map with a, a red color indicate a high activity, you see this place cell have a higher firing rate around this corner, which is called the place field for this place cell. And if we consider more place cells, a group of place cells actually have a different location for their place field. So it's like they can tile or cover the entire space, like providing some sort of map to the environment. So it is like a, a in, in, in initially people just consider it's like a, a map or a, a nowadays we call it GPS in our brain to encode the environment information. And on the other hand, there's a very famous uh, a, a clinical case uh, that opened up the whole field of hippocampus as a memory system. So this famous American uh, memory disorder patient is named Henry Malaysian or HM. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, the Henry, he uh, was, uh, Henry, he was an uh, um, epilepsy patient when he was a child, since he was a child. So he has problem uh, uh, to, epilepsy is so serious, to, so serious, so he has problem to finish his school on time and, fin and find a good job. And because it's so difficult to treat, and there's no way to treat it with a conventional method, the doctors decided to perform a bilateral uh, temporal lob lobectomy, which is to remove the anterior two thirds of the hippocampus from this patient. And after the, um, after the- uh, 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 so after the surgery, I'm sorry. So after the surgery and the epilepsy is treated, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, well, New York, I'm going to Sorry. Okay. So after the removing the two thirds of the hippocampus, Henry's epilepsy problem is fixed. Okay, he has no, he had no epilepsy anymore, but he became a man who living at the same, always living in the same date for the rest of his life. So that means he, he every day he cannot form any new memory, uh, form any new memory uh, after the hippocampus was removed. Um, every day he wake up is just like yesterday and just like the day after the surgery. And he, not only he cannot form new memory, he also lost some of the memory prior to the surgery. So it is uh, retro, it's, so he has a serious anterior gray amnesia and partial retro gray amnesia. Although he can remember memory this long, uh, long ago down back to his, uh, his childhood. So from that time, people think, okay, so memory must be, so hippocampus must be important, very important for the memory formation. But what's the deal between the spatial navigation and the memory? Um, uh, so as more evidence mounting and more uh, theories, con theories con con consider, people start to think, okay, maybe the hippocampus main function is not uh, encode the, uh, the position information only. And it may be provide some sort of coordinate system or some sort of re uh, some sort of uh, map for the for the brain to register the important events happen at that particular location. 
So it is, it looks like a place, but it's essentially really a, a spatial dependent memory of events or, mem or memory of experience uh, uh, that's encoded by the place cell. So really it's a higher dimensional coding, not only, not, of, not only the space, but also uh, the experience. So we know that in the, in the brain, uh, there are place cell, such as this one, uh, the place cell that has a place field in this delay region. And, but there are a, fra a, a, a fraction of place cell that's not only, the place field firing is not only uh, purely depend on the animal's physical position in the environment, but also it depends on the animal's uh, behavior, like the animal is going to turn to the left or turn to the right in the, in the virtual environment. So this is the kind of the choice related place cell firing. And so the question is, what kind of cellular mechanism can support uh, the, uh, the, the, the formation of the learning process that facilitate this high dimensional code? The uh, evidence uh, or the clue come from one of the recent study where they all, the mouse is half fixed. And uh, again, half fixed and running in a treadmill, linear treadmill. The treadmill is attached with different features or objects. So it's kind of a virtual reality, but the mouse doesn't have to do any task. It's just running and collect the reward. Uh, in the different places. So when the, when the experimenter uh, plays a patch clamp electrode to the dorsal hippocampus, CA1, a recall from a single parameter cell, um, in the beginning, we see the intracellular memory potential is pretty flat. So it's uh, no activity at all. So it is, it is called a silent cell. It does not report the animal's position. But in, in some lab, suddenly they observe a very large and spontaneous deployment, a, a, a long and long duration deployization, which called calcium plateau potential. And immediately right after the activity in the next lab, the cells start to fire and have this robust firing according to animals' virtual position on the belt and throughout the entire recording. So the idea here is really there's a synaptic plasticity occur uh, at some place uh, that in the, at the moment that may be relevant for the animal. And the plasticity is coming. It is the plasticity is coming from an event that's driven by the synaptic computation uh, with different synaptic input from upstream areas. So the different upstream area uh, can provide input that coordinate or process by the synaptic or dendritic uh, processing uh, procedures, and therefore provide a, a nonlinear uh, uh, mechanism to trigger the potentiation of synapses, and it potentiate or strengthen the synapses. Uh, those active when the, at the same time when the plateau occur. So when the animal come to this place, the plateau occur, and then the synapse is activate during this place was potential, and therefore turn on the place cell into a, a, the silent cell, turn on the place cell and encode for that position. And the default model is 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 that uh, uh, every place cell is like a black blank paper or black uh, a blank uh, slate. It can be turned on to be a place cell that encode any arbitrary position. It only depends on when the plateau potential occur because it have all sorts of different uh, synaptic input that they are all weak, but represent different place because of the random connection. So that, that is the default thinking about how this plateau potential as an instruction, as an instructive signal, tell the cell, hey, now I want you to turn on because there's something interesting happened at this place happen at this place. So please be turned on, be a place sale and encode experience here. Okay, but remember this task is a passive task. Animal doesn't have to remember anything to perform the task. So the question is whether the pure place sale here, the mechanism of plateau can be also used to trigger a higher dimensional representation like the context dependent place sale I, I just mentioned in a more uh, in, in a more complex task. And I think this is an interesting question, not only from the learning perspective, but also this selective potentiation of presynaptic input by the plasticity pr provides us a window to look into the property of their presynaptic network uh, mechanism, which which I will talk about the circuit mechanism uh, in a few uh, in a few minutes. Okay. So I will start uh, showing you the result by, by saying that this task uh, in the virtual reality required dorsal hippocampus because when we inject the mucemo, the GABA-A receptor agonist to silence the dorsal hippocampus, we see the animal successful rate in this task was dramatically impaired from nearly 100% down to 50%, which is essentially the animal just randomly choose left, left or choose right, uh, regardless of what the cues are. 
and and but one day after the performance goes uh, recover back uh, to the uh, very good level. So this is a hippocampus dependent uh, uh, behavior. And once the animal learn well how to uh, once the animal learn comfortably run in this treadmill and do task, and then we can uh, it pr pr place the a tiny glass electrode, the patch clamp electrode, into the dorsal hippocampal C1 region to patch the pyramidal cell and to re record the input and output relationship from the cells. So uh, I will start by uh, showing you a slightly modified, uh, slightly modified paradigm. Uh, it's easier to understand from this uh, order. So if we have the task exact, essential, exactly the same, everything the same, except that in this task animal, go through the Q region, delay region, and go left or go right to get a reward. But the reward delivery now is purely probabilistic, meaning that it's, it's independent of what initial cues are, it's just random. So the random reward would approximate or, uh, or, or similar to the passive task I mentioned in the beginning, right? I mentioned in the, in the, uh, refer in the reference uh, uh, literature. And once we animal can do this uh, passive random reward task, as long as he passed through this later part of the delay region, we uh, a large and short and short duration of current was injected to the soma of the uh, CA1 cell and trigger this plateau potential. And then you can see there are different traces here. Is a uh, different uh, trial uh, represented one individual trials with different initial cues. And in the first three trials show here, there's no activity at all. So again, this is also a silent cell. But when I start to uh, inject the current in um, trial type uh, in initial cues B, in, and and in these three trials, and immediately no more than a few seconds, you see the there has been a very strong firing field established because of this plateau potential can let through the uh, rest of the recording, and it's independent of what the initial cues are. And I apologize for this a different lens of recording because it's really in time. So because animal running different speed. This is, although looks like a different position, but it's actually different in time. But if we if we map that activity down back to the position, you will see this is firing at the same place. So if I do that and showing you the firing as a heat map for individual different trials or different labs, you see right after the class calcium plateau triggering, there's a establish of the very robust firing activity at the same position in the virtual uh, reality environment which is reminiscent, very similar to what we just see, the passive task uh, scenario where the place field is uh, firing almost in every trial. If we look at the intracellular membrane potential, which is the voltage across the membrane below the action potential threshold, and you see before the induction, the action uh, membrane potential is pretty flat, but after the induction, you see there's a very uh, clear, a prominent field uh, deprivation, the peak around the, where the in, uh, plateau potential was introduced, but it's pretty irrelevant. It's pretty uh, independent of what the initial cues are. So trial with initial cues N and B, they are all very similar on average. Okay, so now um, what's going on here? So now. Um, Let's go back to the, the original uh, task we talked about, which is the reward has to contingent or depend on the initial cues. And then now I on, now the plateau was only introduced in the trial with a certain turning direction. For example, this is a reward at the right, and the animal will always almost turn to the right direction. And then not, not introduced in the left turning direction. And you can see the, plot, the place field is, was introduced, is induced now very robustly. But only now the place field firing happened only in the right turning trial, but not on the left turning trial. So if we can, if we calculate the firing rate against animals' position, uh, um, compare between different trial types, you see a very dramatic difference of the firing rate and peak around the induction side and very high in the uh, in trial same as induced direction, but on average pretty small uh, or close to zero uh, in the different from the induced direction. So before we go into the intracellular membrane potential, uh, which is uh, which is an approximation of the input the cell receive, I want to pause a little a moment to think about what kind of information we can get from the intracellular dynamics of this uh, uh, context-dependent place cell. 
So we can think about the intracellular input with different scenario. In one extreme of the spectrum, the input could be a combination of the place, uh, spatial input, and the context of the behavioral input. So these are two different input and uh, with uh, carry different information, but summa summated or uh, added together in the postsynaptic cell. So in one extreme, one type of one extreme, you can see the result maybe like this. There is a, a, a same spatial, pure spatial input with the same shape that's on top, adding on top of uh, a context of behavioral dependent input. And it is only the context of behavioral input will uh, exhibit uh, depending on what the initial cues or the context or the behavioral context are. And then, and then you have this differential uh, crossing of the action potential threshold, and therefore differential uh, firing. And another example is you, you may it may be the context contextual input is not uh, so slow, but it's more like a transient input, but with a very long tail. It's triggered by the initial cues, but it can add on top of this uh, same uh, spatially dependent input with the same shape and exhibit it depending on the trial type. And also have this uh, differential firing scenario as a consequence. In another scenario, another extreme, you can think maybe there are only one set of synapses which carry all the information, carry the spatial information and also the behavioral re relevant information. So they essentially they are really the same uh, shape of spatial environment, uh, uh, the same shape of synaptic input that depends on the space. But there is a strong modulation of the amplitude of the uh, spatial input, and therefore the input is really a, a co is a joint function of both the position and the animal's behavioral context. So what is the actual uh, result we, we observed? So the actual result of being observed is that when we look at intracellular memory potential, we see before the induction is pretty flat in terms of the intracellular memory potential, but after the induction, the memory potential is very different. The, in the trial, seamless induced direction is about 10 millivolt, uh, 9 to 10 millivolt at the peak due, uh, around the induction site. But on the other direction, that's different from the induced direction is pretty flat on average. So it is closer to the last scenario we talk about, where the input is a conjunct, co is a co is a joint function of uh, both information, and it's probably provided by the same set of. It is probably is a same synapse, but uh, but because the potentiation event only potentially one set of the input, but not the other set. Uh, only only provide this. It's a very extreme all or none scenario. So this is actually pretty consistent with the model that there are two set of joint function uh, represented by the synaptic input. So the, uh, the, the red set of input here um, is the uh, turning direction plus the position. The right set of input is the turning direction on the right and the uh, animal's position. And when, we, when, we, when I turn on the uh, uh, plateau potential in the left trial, only the left uh, set of synapse was potentiated. And therefore, they, they've become a full-blown depolarization in the left turning trials in the up subsequent uh, uh, testing, but no uh, plastic, uh, no uh, activity at all in the right turning trial. So I want to elaborate this uh, on the conceptual uh, on the concept of this uh, model further by drawing you this diagram. So we 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 recall from the C A one neuron, and we talk about the potentiation of the input. Uh, going to the C1. So now we're really trying to talk about by uh, the property of the presynaptic networks, such as in uh, CA3, for example. And the presynaptic networks can be completely separate, non-overlapping. But as, but these two sub networks can, before before the plateau induction and plasticity occur, the cell can look still look like a silent cell. Why? Because as long as the synaptic excitation to C1 are overall the same from the two networks, and they are relatively weak. The C1 cell before the plasticity, it just looked like receive a balanced input from either of the turning scenarios, and it's weak, so it's silent, just like a silent cell. But after the plateau induced in a particular trial type, you potentiate the uh, input from that particular uh, associated with that. Uh, uh, the, of, of the input associated with that trial information, and therefore you can produce an all non like behavior uh, in the postsynaptic cell, and uh, uh, by by means of this uh, induction. 
So um, we can really think. Of, so as I re, as I said, we can uh, sort of probe or uh, try to elucidate the property of precision M networks by this very interesting experimental paradigm. So really, what based on the uh, precision uh, network connectivity uh, uh, patterns, like in CA3 or entorhinal cortex. The, this upstream area have recurrent reciprocal, reciprocal bidirectional connection between different neurons. We can really model the upstream area of into two different uh, sub networks. With the detail of connectivity, I want to skip here because of the time and for simplicity. I don't want to dig into the detail of the model. But these two different sub networks can have a connectivity pattern of the excitation inhibition. So they can be modeled as uh, two different uh, so called attractor uh, into in the state space. So these attractors uh, are two different uh, rim where the system tends to move toward. So in this state space, each point represents uh, activity of the combination of a population of neurons. So as the point move in this state space, it represents the firing patterns of the presynaptic neuron dynamics is also changing. And for example, if the animal start with a trial in the trial type A, they see the initial cues, the system will fall into this complex A attractor and start to move along these uh, barrels according to animal's position in this environment. Similarly, if the animal start a trial by seeing the initial cues in the context B, the system, the system state could, in the model, could fall into this attractor and move along the uh, trajectory of the basin uh, of, of the uh, a bat, uh, of the basin according to animal's position in this environment. So we can uh, use the same. We can use the math. This, uh, we, we can use the math to describe the property of presynaptic network. Uh, based on the, our inference from this plasticity experimental paradigm to describe the presynaptic property using the math that's uh, essentially the same mathematical framework that has been applied extensively to a uh, cyclic system with some sort of memory, such as uh, the airflow in the atmosphere or the weather system. Uh, they have these uh, circles of uh, phenom uh, circular phenomena or cyclic phenomena. Okay, so um, I want to end the project uh, by say by giving you a big uh, a picture of the summary. So when it, so uh, when an animal running through this uh, place uh, virtual environment and in the, this delay region, we we focus on the place here with the place here here, which can provide some sort of combination of uh, spatial and uh, context information. Before the animal learn. Uh, any association of the initial cues in the reward. So that's the passive task I talked about in the beginning. In this passive task, uh, the initial cues is just no, not meaningful for the animal, right? It's, it's have nothing to do with whether they can gain more water, so fewer water uh, or less water. So the plateau potential can potentiate all the synapses that activate the animal is in this particular position and therefore make the silent cell into a pure, a conventional place cell. But once the animal learn the initial cues is useful, he can look at the initial cues to get more sugar water. The, the meaning of the cue is learned, or the behavioral relevance of the initial cue was learned by the presynaptic circuit. So there, there become this segregation of presynaptic circuit into two different attractors. And therefore, the input received by the postsynaptic cell has a seg seg segregated uh, functional uh, subsets um, and into they have this segregated different uh, sets of inputs. And therefore, when animal come to this place and when the plateau was occur in a particular direction of the trial, such as the left, it can potentiate the left turning synapses and turn into a context dependent spatial uh, spatial call. So really, this is a, a very rapid and flexible cellular rule that been identified for a manifestation or the routing of the conjunctive higher dimensional information to the downstream area. And this is also for the first time a cellular uh, plasticity rule has been demonstrated to be able to produce a higher dimen dimensional code uh, in the hippocampus. So for the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I hope to uh, provide some uh, to share uh, the future direction in my research. So as I reveal in, in my presentation, I think you, I hope you could uh, uh, at least part, at least you can you could appreciate that the focus on my lab really is to 
to use this uh, multi uh, level of multi scale analysis try to address one uh, important question which is can we uh, which is how the complexity of neuron computation and its associated cellular property can support the computation uh, of the circuit that's required for certain behavioral uh, functions so as i reveal there are different excitatory input project to the dendrite of ca1 place cell they are from the cortical area like an entorhinal cortex or from different hippocampal subregion like a ca3 but this is a very classical uh, diagram for the hippocampal clay cell circuit. But if I inject a virus, uh, adeno associated virus, they can use as an anterior grade tracing uh, agent and a thalamus and subnucleus called reunions. And you, I can see there a very clear axonal bundle or the projection that goes to the distal dendritic area of the CA1 parameter cell. So, uh, so this is a very much underappreciated uh, pathway which project to the distal dendrite of ca1 and these neurons receive the, the output or the information from the prefrontal area prefrontal cortex is a region well known to be very important uh, or uh, widely considered important for uh, executive functioning uh, the planning and the decision making and the choice so the the central problem here is how would this different stream of information with different uh, uh, properties can cooperate and use the computational processing uh, property of the dendrites and provide information that's, uh, that support the property of the place cell that's required in a more complex environment? And there's another very important aspect that's not in this diagram yet, which is the interneural microcircuit. So there are there are more than 20 different subtypes of uh, interneuron uh, existing in this uh, hippocampal region. And they can be broadly categorized into different uh, uh, cat and different groups. They project to the distal dendrite, project to the proximal dendrite, project to the soma, even the axon initial segments. And, and different input, different upstream neurons, they can provide input when they project to CA1. They can also engage this or from synapse on this interneuron with different uh, with different uh, propensity or different uh, connectivity, such as the reunion's neuron can project can have a one type of combination of connectivity, while the entorhinal cortical neuron can provide different uh, 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 combination of connectivity to the subtypes. So my overall rationale is: if we really want to understand how the computation arises. That can support a circuit. We really have to map out this microcircuit and to under and, and to to have a and to have a clue of uh, how this uh, how this uh, synaptic connectivity matrix between the upstream neuron and the interneurons and can provide the relevant information through the to the uh, process. So my method is to use to combine an anterior grade and retrograde uh, vi uh, viral tracing methods based on rabies virus and the adeno associated virus with specific uh, serotype, serotype 1 and serotype 9. So they can both use as a tracer or the agent to perform transsynaptic uh, labeling of the, of the neurons. And we use this uh, anterior grade and retrograde uh, mapping method in the beginning, and then to map out the connectivity weight matrix between the upstream neuron for each individual pathways. And then we can also selectively uh, validate this uh, mapping result with uh, electrophysiology performed in the Q brain slices with uh, uh, patch clamp recording and optogenetics, as I mentioned. And then based and then based on also, and then on top of this, based on the non uh, connectivity subcellular connectivity between the interneuron subtypes and the post synaptic C1 dendrite. I can I can start to I can construct a, a working hypothesis and working model, try to understand how the properties of place cell with higher dimensional information emerge because of this selective activation of different B4 excitatory inhibitory modules or B4 excitatory inhibitory subcircuits. When these different subcircuits activate activated along together or activated with different temporal relationship or different pan temporal patterns. And, and, and I, think, I think the one holy grail of the systems neuroscience really 
is to see whether we can we can explain some higher order function of circuits uh, or behavior by the property of the neurons. And I, I think uh, one one way uh, to really address to really to address that problem uh, in, in in my mind is a dream experiment that I'm 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 trying to uh, implement in my lab, which is to trying to see uh, really the neural computation unfold in in response to the more complex spatial temporal patterns of input or during behavior in brain tissue or in the intact brain. So here I want to show you an example, a recording that made by my collaborator who used to be Kurt Haas lab. This is a imaging experiment made from a immobilized uh, developing zebra fish. Uh, and, th and, uh, th and this uh, performed by a microscopy called to, uh, random access to photo microscopy. So use the image method really to look at the synapse, every synapse of the entire neuron, which has about 400 synapses. So as you can see, the image method can capture the activity of all the synapses all at the same time, with the, the size of the circle represents the active, activation strength by the Kelsen imaging. So I, I think really this kind of experiment can form a, a, a crucial cornerstone for us to understand how the complex information is fed into uh, the computing machine of our circuits in order to extract info, important information. And and associated with and then to infer the uh, processing of the uh, of the information from the dendritic area and then convey to the soma. Now the challenge is this is a developing fish, uh, transparent, immobilized with a smaller neuron about 400 synapses. In the red brain, for example, the, the, the in the mouse brain or red brain, the brain is a lot bigger, more uh, and it has strong, very strong scattering. It's not so transparent. The neuron are bigger. So whether we can apply this kind of uh, approach in the uh, in the mammalian uh, in the mammalian experiments. So my collaborator, uh, so my collaborator uh, Kasper Pogorski at Genelia, he is helping me to build the uh, a really very novel generation of two photon microscopy. This is a kilohertz frame rate two photon synaptic imaging method called SLAP in my lab, and. Uh, it uses a very sophisticated uh, uh, screen scanning design or scanning engineering, allow us to really look at the three D volume of a brain of a brain tissue uh, with hundreds of microns in each dimension, and look at this three D volume at the at the volume rate of hundred hundred hertz or even kilohertz uh, in total. So really, uh, um, in total, so it. Here I want to show you one of the example recording they made from the layer two three pyramidal cell of the visual cortex in the awake mouse. So the mouse was awake and presented with a very simple visual stimuli, and you can see a very detailed structure of the dendrites of this of the cell, and you can and this little small stop or small bump along the dendritic dendritic segment are the dendritic spine, which is a fundamental connection or what we call the synapse. And this synaptic connection, uh, uh, you, you can see this uh, red color is the activity from a yellow blue sniffer. It's a sensor for glutamate release. So, so it is the input fast synaptic uh, excitation or excitatory input that feed into the, this postsynaptic cell. And the red color uh, show the higher uh, input strength uh, evolve over time. So you can see a very detailed and very uh, uh, refined uh, pattern of activity in the, in the brain tissue. And please pay attention to this uh, time. The frame between the time between each frame is at a time scale of 0.1 millisecond uh, here at the bottom. So it is really a uh, 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 10 kilohertz frame rate scanning. They can cover a wide diversity, a wide range of different uh, physiological events depending on the sensor you use uh, in the tissue, and it can and it can cover. Most, most importantly, it can, it's fast enough to capture the fattest uh, physiological event, which is the action potential uh, initially from the soma from the dendrites, what we call dendritic spike. So I want to end the, end the entire talk back to our uh, big picture, just make a, just make, just close the loop. I think the great uh, neuro anatomist and theorist, David Ma, one of my favorite uh, scientist, he like to emphasize to approach the understanding of the system from three different levels. The level of implementation, which is uh, what a system is made of, 
the level of algorithm, which is what the different subcomponents of the system interact with each other. And the level of computation is really what the system trying to do. And I think the conventional wisdom from the molecular and cellular uh, neuroscience is at this axis where we really, which I have been fascinating for many years. And I, I think they tell us a lot about what the cells and the molecules can do. And on the other axis, uh, which is where more, more like a top-down normative theoretical approach from the theoretical neuroscience, they ask, if you want to have a system X, they can, they can perform this function, then what's the property that the system should have? So, and uh, systems neurophysiology uh, approach has become very trendy nowadays, which I particularly refer to the optical and the electrical method can record a very large population of neural cells. I think they are very cool and very amazing for allowing us to detail understand the, the property of the information that's encoded by a group of cells. And also we can infer some sort of the algorithm of how the information is processed. But I would, I would say it was still very difficult for us to understand the origin of the computation in the circuits in a strict sense, because this method on, look, look, pretty much just look at the output of the neuron by the action potential itself or the calcium signal that's associated with the action potential. It would be very difficult still to understand how the um, cell use the molecules and the properties to realize the computation, the processing that's important for the function. So I think there is a very big gap here, and the approach or uh, and the approach in my, my 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 the approach in my lab or the things I'm trying to uh, to work toward is really to focus to to uh, to deeply rooted in the detailed understanding of cellular physiology and trying to ask if, if the arithmetics and the logical operation that's supported by this cellular property can really constrain the very big space of the algorithm or the computation that's provided by the theory. And therefore, we can have a better understanding, a uh, more thorough understanding of the mechanics of the brain function. So I want to end my talk by saying that my lab, uh, just like uh, Pan Lao said, it just started a few months ago uh, at Zhongyuan Yuan Shen Yiso at IBMS. And uh, my lab will use uh, the, the cut will use the range of different methods that I just mentioned that covers electrophysiology, anatomy, mouse behavior, life imaging, and theory and modeling. And my lab is actively recruiting. Uh, 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 I'm recently um, particularly interested in the peop in the in, in people or students or uh, uh, any people. Who are who has a background of uh, say uh, uh, computational uh, numerical simulation physics or the uh, imaging or the optics? But that being said, I think everyone is really welcome to apply. I think we uh, my lab my lab require a wide range of different people with different expertise, including biology and all other different uh, subfields. So please consider and spread the words for me or to anyone you think who might be interested. Uh, in the approach. And my lab website is on, online. Uh, so if you are interested to get a little bit more details, please uh, go to see the neuroncomputelab.wordpress.com to see a uh, uh, more description of the, uh, of the ideas. And the uh, construction is uh, being uh, developed and is quick. And I also, so in the end, I want to uh, thank the full support of my previous advisor, Nelson Spruston. And also, uh, Xin Yu Zhao is my colleague and collaborator, which we designed a behavioral task uh, together. And we perform, uh, I perform some of the big subset of recording, and he, provide, uh, he also uh, performs some of the important subset of recording. And I want to end here, and I'm happy to take any questions or any suggestion, advice. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy uh, the presentation. OK， 谢谢徐博士的演讲。那其实涵盖了蛮多的范畴。那不晓得同学们有没有没有什么问题？你们可以直接打开麦克风就直接开始讲，或者你也可以用聊天的功能那边直接写在文字板上面。我想在同学还在还在思考问题的时候，我就很好奇说，因为 p r e s s sale 是说哦，那我今天。到某个地方的时候，在整个 field 里面，到某个地方的时候，它就会特别反应，比较比较在某个点的地方就特别反应。那你在一开始的时候用一个就是等于一个插入口的一个一个测试
。那我我就很好奇说，嗯、今天如果说我们一直一直就是说，吕沃永远假设吕沃的永远都在一边，那或者 Q 永远弄在一边，那他每次走到岔路口的时候，我们能不能找到一个 play sale？ 这是 play sale， 就是说就直接往左边或者往往右边这样子，就是说等于把它加权加到百分之百这样子，这样走到岔路口的时候就一定往那边走。所以潘老师的意思是说，如果他没有这个 probability， 就是他的如果他比如说往左的 reward 的 probability 是一的话，对，呃，那这次 play sale， 我我我很好奇说他会不会被强化到已经特别强化这样子？对，呃，我想老师讲的这个，如果是他没有 probability 在左边 reward 跟右边 reward， 如果如果变成零跟一的话，就是百分之百跟零的话，那一个直接的结果应该就是这个老鼠可能，如果它够聪明，它应该就是只会往左边走，它<笑>就是一弄这个点子。<笑>对对对，所以它其实就应该会，我的预测就是它会变成 traditional 的 play， 它就会变成一个 traditional 的 play field 了。嗯哼，那老师刚,刚讲那个情况其实比较类似我们这种 random reward 的。Scheme 就是说，我们还是希望老鼠可以往左转、往右转。那只是说，它转到哪里，其实跟它会不会得到 reward 就没有关系了。然后在这种情况下来测试，那我的 play s a l e 在这个 learning 的呃 cellular 的 learning 的 algorithm 会产生什么结果？那如果我们看到它就是一个 traditional 或 conventional 的 play s a l e 这样子，嗯。那个徐老师，你有看到同学聊天的地方？有，我是不是要先按 share？ 哦，可以，我可以看到。对，不用不用，你就直接按那个聊天那个地方，就会看到，就会看到同学问写的问题。呃，陈呃，请问徐研究员使用的这个虚拟 paradigm 跟实体的 maze 比有什么优点呢 ？OK， 很好的问题，所以。这个虚拟的 paradigm 跟实体比有好几个优点，那其中两个优点我在刚刚已经有稍微提到，就是说，首先它可以在实体的 paradigm 里面，我们可以尽量，呃，就首先你，我想希望你们有了解到这件事情，就是说，我们现在为了要探讨这个 play s a l e 的 firing， 它跟 animal 在做什么 behavior 或即将做什么 behavior 有关系，我们希望这个或者是它。呃，我们希望可以把所有其他的 variable 都尽量排除，所以我们希望呃老鼠能够呃在同一个地方的时候，它就看到它在 delay region 的我们探讨那边的 place sale 是 context dependent 的 place variable， 我们就希望它在那边呃看到一样的景象，做一样的事情，尽量做一样的事情。那那个时候的 play 那在这种情况下看到的 place sale 的 variable 如果跟它的 Trial type 还有关系的话，那我们比较合理的可以去推论说，它大概就是跟这个 behavior 的 context 的关系比较大一些。那所以在这样子的一个要求之下 ，virtual reality 的一个优点就是说，我们可以非常严格的去控制它看到的这个，它能够看到的这个景象，因为嗯嗯。呃呃因为即使你把这个在真实的 version 里面，即使你把这个 tunnel 做的非常的窄，其实这个老鼠它不但还是可以稍微靠边走，就算它往左转的时候，它不会就靠着左边的墙走；往右转的时候，不一不一定要靠着右边墙。就算它真的靠中间走，好，我们就先免除这个 variable， 先 remove 这个 variable， 它的头的方向还是可能会有不一样。你知道它的头只要有一点点角度的不同，它其实看到了它的 retina， 还有它的 v1。看到可能就是一个非常不一样的景象，所以我们为了要能够尽量减少那个 c o n f o u n d 所以呃 virtual reality 就有一个很大的优点，就是我们可以让老鼠尽量看到一样的的 very 一样的景象，所以呃我们我们 argue 说他看到这个 differential neural activity 比较是来自于他的 behavior， 或者他过去看到了那个 initial cue 给他的 circuit 造成的一个 memory 产生的结果。那另外一个优点当然就是因为我们要探讨这个 s a l e 的 input output， 还有它的 plasticity， 所以这个是用呃 patch c l a m 的这个 technique 是比较容易达成的。那嗯、呃，虚拟的呀， yeah, 呃，当然当然就是说也可以做一些在实在实体的的 m a s e 里面很难做到的工作，比如说你可以去 manipulate 那些 Q， 你可以变化它们的 pattern 或它们的位置或它们的 contrast。
等等的，在在这个 learning 的过程中，所以你可以比较容易的去，所以那个它开启了一种可能，就让我们可以去了解这些 Q 跟 behavior relevance 跟你的 neural code 之间的一个关系。OK， 呃，下一个问题是老师一开始提到对于 event 和 experience 的记忆，可以视为一种抽象的空间记忆。想请问，目前有哪些实验方法或证据造成这个结论呢？我想要理，我想要理清一下你的这个问题。你说的这个结论是指说，哦，我就直接念你讲的这个句子 ：event experience 的记忆可以视为一种抽象的空间记忆。呃，你的这个句子的意思就是说，呃。我我把它 rephrase， 我我真的想要表达的意思就是说 ，play s a l e 它表现的 firing 虽然跟 place animal 的 position 有很大的关系，但是它也跟呃这个 animal 在某一个点它经历过了某一些事情，或者是跟它的 behavior 要完成某一些工作，跟它的 choice 或 goal 有某一些关联性。所以我所谓的抽象的空间记，我我你讲的这个抽象空间记忆，我想我的真正的意思就是说，它是一个比较高维度的。的的展现，所以它有有空间，也有跟空间以外其他的事情。所以我的这个描述其实是一个，只是一个描述，就是说，基于我们现在看到这种 context dependent play style， 它其实就是一个多于一个维度的讯息的的 information encode 在这个 play style 里面。好像没有其他的问题了。嗯，同学还有什么问题吗？呃，在。不好意思，我可以问吗？可以啊，请说。可以，可以。呃，就是像其他在 i n g r a m 的研究，就是一些比较跟空间无关的记忆，会探讨就是 cortical 的 representation。就是呃，如果我学习过了比较长一段时间之后，就是我的 retrieval 会变得就是比较不依赖那个海马回的那些 cells 的启动，就是有点像它、嗯，就是这个学习会，就是、那 i n g r a m 会有一点。它表征会移动的感觉。那我想知道，就是、嗯、呃，老师实验室的老鼠，就是当他们做这些就是学习，比如他走那个 maze， 他过一两个礼拜之后，嗯、他的这个就是如果之后我把呃这些 play play cell 把它沉默掉的话，或是反正就是抑制它的话，它有有没有办法就是还有表现，有没有这方面的探讨？呃，你讲的这个应该就是我们讲的 complementary 呃、uh, system 或 complementary learning system， 对不对？你的 idea 那个 idea 应该就是说，刚开始形成了 memory， 好像是是存在 hippocampus 里面，然后随着时间它会慢慢的 transfer 到其他的地方，像是 neural cortex， 所以不再是 hippocampus dependent 这样。像你讲的应该是这件事。那你说我有没有去 silence？ 如果你讲的是 silence， 要看这个工这个 task 还是不是会 depend on hippocampus， 这个我们没有做过。呃，不过你讲了一个非常有趣的 point， 就是说我我事实上没有想过这件事情，就是说如果这些这一些呃这个 learning 的 algorithm 会不会 depend on 你呃学习了这，因为因为我们刚刚的 model 里面关于这个 choice。跟 behavior 相关的 signal 是存在于它的上游里面，它的上游可能是 CA3， 就还是在 hippocampus 里面，它的上游有可能是 entorhinal cortex， for example， 那就是在 hippocampus 外面。所以会不会这一些跟 behavior relevant 的 signal， 以及这些 signal 所需要的能够产生这个这种呃呃 plasticity 的 learning 的条件，会跟你学了这个 task 多久有关系？这个这个我倒是没有想过，会不会？比如说一个月以后，如果我们不是训练三十个礼拜来做这个的 plasticity 的实验，而是训练了三个月之后来做这个 plasticity 的实验，会不会这个 learning rule 就不 work？ 因为相关的 information， 呃，未必用同样的方式表征在在脑子里面，所以我就不知道。这是一个蛮有趣的 point。嗯、呃，对，因为，嗯呃，就是一般好像会觉得 play cell 是呃，就是 essential for 这种就是空间的回忆，就是对。可是照老师刚才讲法，会会对
配色，感觉有比较，呃，它的就是它概念上好像比较复杂一点。它是有关于就是像刚才提到的，就是事件那些东西，所以我会对才会提出这个 idea， 觉得这个蛮有趣这样。OK， 其实 hippocampus 现近年最近过，尤其是过去这十年，有很多研究说明它有许多非空间的 encoding 的 dimension， 包括跟时间有关的 encoding， 还有包括跟、呃、甚至是跟听觉有关的 recording。有一个实验，它完全做的就是不是 hippocamp， 不是这个老鼠在做 navigation， 它就老鼠站着，然后就在摇，或者是 have fix， 然后它就是让它控制。听那个声音的频率，然后控制摇杆，就他发现了跟 play s a l e 类似的这种 auditory frequency s a l e 他有 play s f i e l d 在这个 case 就是 auditory frequency s a l e 在 C 在 hippocampus 里面，所以他甚至可以是非空间，完全跟空间没有关系，是一个跟听觉的这个频率的这个空间的一个 encoding。啊、呃，这在再次说明的这种 idea， 就是说 hippocampus 它其实 encode 不是未必是一个具体的空间的 mapping， 而是一个任何一个抽象的空间 mapping， 它只是可以连接到具体的空间上面。好、哦，谢谢。哦，下，嗯，不会不会，好像还有一位同学，他问说，请问这样的空间学习是可逆的吗？可以让小鼠学习，或、哦、再度让它忘记？呃，我不知道有没有这种 extinction 的实验，呃，不，这不是 extinction， 因为这不是 field memory。Anyway， 就是我不知道有人有有没有那种可逆的实验，但是有一种方式可以让他学习的内容发生变化，就是说，他可以把你的刚开始的 Q， 比如说 A 跟 B 嘛，可能 A 是对应到转左边 ，B 是对应到转右边，但你可以把这个 association 给 reverse。你让老鼠练一练，呃，学了这个 association 之后呢，开始把这个 A 变成 reward 在右边，然后 B 变成 reward 在左边，就把这个关系给对调。刚开始老鼠会很 confused， 但是一些 preliminary 的 data 就是呃，以前我的 lab 里面开始有做一些这方面实验，发现这个老鼠它就可以，呃，它刚开始很 confused， 但是它会很快的就意意识到。并不是他在做一个完全不相干、没有逻辑的 test， 而是只是类似的 test， 只是这个 contingency 对调了。他他他可以用一个相对比较快的速度去学习这个 test， 不用也许不用再花三个礼拜，而只需要花三天就可以把这个对调的手学选再学会。所以看起来老鼠在某一些情况下，呃，是可以做到我们所谓的 meta learning， 就是说它可以在一个既有的基础上面。他了解到这个规则的抽象法则，只是将里面的某一些具体的 component 给变化了。他仍然用一样的规则，只是把具体的 component 给变化了，可以做到这个事情。那这个 meta learning 对于它的 plasticity 以及它的 place 呃 place cell 的 coding 有什么样的影响？我想那是一个相当有趣的问题。OK， 同学还没有什么问题？同学可以善用那个，因为。这个也有举手功能，所以可以在自己的头像旁边应该有个举手功能。如果你需要举手的话，想要讲话，这样子可能如果很多人同时要讲话的话，会比较方便。哎，这也是让各位同学以后可以多练习这种线上会议，以后大概大家的机会越来越多。哎，我另外一个问题，因为你后面有提到说你要用一个 kilohertz 甚至 ten kilohertz 的 image 的系统。那我记得我几年前去参加 meeting 的时候，也看过有用做这个、嗯，但是当然这个那时候最大问题其实还在于说，一个就是那个那个 imaging 或者是说那个染剂的，或者是说那荧光的强度、嗯。那这个荧光的强度，我我好奇说，那你到时候要用怎样子的？因为我所知道现行的这些 imaging 的，不管是 chemical 或者是 protein， 好像都不大够让你可以这么短时间内去 capture 到一个足够的强的变化讯号。嗯，潘老师是 imaging 的专家，所以问了一个比较专业的问题，就是说，我潘老师提的这个问题，呃，我我稍微给大家说一下，就是说，因为我的 image 的速度很快，所以表示我在同样的视野里面，每一个 pixel， 呃，我扫描，我镭射，我的刺激，我的 excitation， 我的刺激镭射停留的时间会变得很短。那在这个情况下，如果你的荧光，它你的荧光的这个 reporter， 它的效率不够好，或者是说它不够亮
，或者是说你 believe 的镭射不足以让它够发出呃有意义的讯号的话，这个 image 就会变得很困难。那确实是一个很大的 bottleneck。那我们我们我们这个新的系统的 address 的方法是两个方向，一个是呃。我们用了非常高能量的镭射，就在这个 case 里面，我们用的是呃呃工业镭射，所以这种镭射的 output 是在呃我有点忘了这个这个镭射的 output 应该是在三十三十多瓦左右，所以这种高对，所以这个高能的这个 p 高能的 IR 的 pulse 的镭射啊、呃，它的它它可以提高，它可以。进行这种非常快速的扫描，然后，呃，在一般的出波筒镭射的 image 里面是没有办法做到的。然后第二个方向是，确实在这这些年来，这个呃 c h i n e l i a 它透过他们的 team branch， 他们也 develop 相当不相当好的 sensor， 特别是供给我刚刚讲的这个镭射的一个的使用的一个波长。那是黄色，这是为什么那个 sensor 是黄色的？这是一些设计上面的考量。嗯、那这些 sensor， 这个这个 sensor 确实比以前亮很多。然后，所以呃，比较 work 比较好的一些 sensor 就是包括像 glutamate 的 sensor、acetylcholine 的 sensor、calcine 的 sensor， 有 different 的不同的 color 啊、呃嗯，还有还有红色的 sensor 跟啊、呃、绿色的 sensor。然后，呃。还现在现在目前在 develop， 就是还还大家都在昂首期盼的，就是这个 two photon 的 voltage sensor 能够真正的被 nail down 下来，啊、呃，所以有好几种可以用的 sensor 这样子，呃，可以搭配着使用。OK， 谢谢谢，因为这个这显然是一整套一起要改进的，不是说只有速度，其实包括那个 image sensitivity。哎、欸，这个都是一一起要跟着动的，哎、欸，对对对，所以这其实是一个非常复杂的 engineering 的问题。嗯 ，OK， 那同学有没有什么问题想要问的？问徐老师的。哎、啊，金老师的，嗯、欸，我来请教一个问题。呃，呃，金老师是很精彩的演讲哈、哦。我我想请教两个问题、嗯。第一个是说，我在想说，因为你现在发现这个 mechanism 啊。那如果是在这、嗯、是在 play sale 上面，那 grid sale 上你会不会觉得也是一样的 mechanism？ 嗯，或是其他的 speed sale 或是 velocity sale， 因为人家陆陆陆续续发现这些特殊任务的 sale 嘛，会不会是一样的 mechanism， 还是是不一样的？特别是 grid sale， 因为跟 play sale 很相关。对对对，赖老师问的这个问题，就是说对于这个 plateau potential 在 d e n d r i t e 上面能够非常。specific 的 induce 呃、uh, plasticity， 然后可以立刻产生 play sale 这件事情，或者是每某一种 receptive field， 我们 generally speaking 这不一定要是 place， 也可以是比如说 visual 的 receptive field 或其他种类的 receptive field， 这个是不是这有多大程度是一个 generalizable， 就是可以用在套用在其他系统的一个 mechanism， 是现在这个 field 大家都很想知道的事情，因为因为呃 p l a t e a u potential 可以说是第一个。真正意义上被 identify， 可以在这么可以在可以这么 robust， 然后在几秒钟的时间内就可以产生一个新的 receptive field， 而且是透过 dendritic 的 plasticity。我想这是第一个真的被在真正意义上被证实的事情，大概就在这几年之间。所以说，呃，比如说刚刚讲的这个 layer two three 的呃 parameter s a l e 它其实也有类似 plateau potential 这样的现象，但是还是但是在 cortical area 没有什么人做它的 plasticity。呃，然后呃，这是一个，这还是一个灰色，还是一个不是很明朗的地带。然后刚刚呃，赖老师讲的这个 breast cell， 它是在 entorhinal cortex。breast cell 确实有两篇非常好的 paper， 大概在一五年左右，他们就是一起发出来，然后他们都用 patch clamp 的方法去研究老鼠在 navigate 的时候的这个 breast cell 的 intracellular 的 activity。然后他们发现这些 breast cell 它也有类似 NMDA dependent 的这个 dendritic spike 的这个 pattern。可是至于说它能不能产生新的 grid pattern， 我是从来没有听过。但我我想它，呃，这些比较，我想这个都这些比较 challenging 的实验，应该都是等待有人去去去真的去把它做出来这样子。呃，我想这是一个很重要的问题。嗯、好，我 follow up 的一个问题就是那个 plateau potential 啊，我我在想说，如果你现在把那个时间点，如果前面后面移到不同的。时间点或不同的位置的时候，你有试过这个效果吗
，因为我在想说 contingency 的问题，就是说，如果你现在是如果在他的一开始的点，或是说到他选择方向的点中间移动不同的时间点的话，给这个 potential 的话，会不会看到一样或是不一样，或是更强或更弱的效果？那老师是说把它移到不同的位置嘛？就是说，在在 maze 里面不同的位置里面，不同的位置。呃，我们有，我想想看，我们有，我们有做过在其他的地方 induce 也可以产生 place feel， 但是我们没有真的很认真的去做它，因为因为呃。呃，一就是有一个第一个问题是它能不能在其他的地方产生 play s a l e 就先不管它是不是 context dependent 的 play s a l e 这个问题呃，对我们来说比较没有吸引力，因为呃呃，因为在前我刚谈到那一篇那那个系列的研究，大概两篇 paper 两三篇 paper， 他们已经非常好的证明了任何一个 play s a l e 任何一个 random chip pick 的 play 的 parameter s a l e 它都可以。在任何一个你选择的地方产生 place feel， 就是没有什么 bias 这样。那所以我们比较没有想要 test 的这件事情。但是至于说是不是在比如说这个 delay region 的某一个地方比较容易产生 splitter s a l e 这个我们还没有测测试过。但这个可能就是一个非常有趣的呃是有趣的 detailed analysis 关于你的 presynaptic network 他们怎么样在你 delay region 的这个过程中。它产生你所需要的资讯，也许就是跟它你在这个 delay 的不同的 phase 有一些关系，也说不一定。嗯哼，但是但是我们没有真的去做这这个 level 的 analysis。嗯，好，谢谢。对 ，OK， 好，如果大家没有问题的话，那我们就再谢谢徐老师。然后这边要鼓掌就蛮。不是，不不是很方便。<笑>好不，我我 ，OK， 我作为主持人，其实有一个哦，对，其实也可以用，同学也用了，其实他也可以有鼓掌的功能。<笑><笑>那其实我这边刚有麦克风的同学忘了关，那那其实是有时候会发生的。谢谢大家。那其实我这边还有一个功能是，我可以，因为我是会议主持人，我可以强迫把所有人全部静音，哎，然后或者是取消全部静音，所以这个东西是是还是可以做得到的，哎。那所以不用担心说那个麦克风就是有人有时候忘了关。那下礼拜我们还是一样会这样的方式进行。那那个呃，另外因为下礼拜戴老师演讲的话，他有一些是病人的资讯，他不希望太过公开，所以我们只有只会在演讲期间播放。然后演讲过后，其实我们就不会再放到 YouTube 上面。哎，所以先让大家知道。不要到时候说，我等今天没有空，我等 YouTube 再看，我可能就没有办法给各位同学看，因为他戴老师不希望说有一些比较，因为关系到病人比较敏感的部分。OK， 好，没有问题的话，那我们今天的演讲就对，就说呃提醒一下同学们，就是说那个 Summer Internship 的部分目前还在继续募集同学中，所以请呃学成的同学有兴趣的话，都欢迎把握机会申请 Summer Internship 的部分。那另外，我们的学生也在招生中，所以也请欢迎把这个讯息分享给你的亲朋好友或同学们，这样有兴趣欢迎加入我们的学程。谢谢。OK， 好，所以同学都很会用这个 Webex 的很多附加的功能。OK， 好，那我们就再谢谢那个徐老师。那如果各位同学对徐老师的研究有兴趣，也可以直接在 email 给他，或者是说可以看看徐老师的研究是需要怎样子的，是不是需要你的专长来协助。OK， 那我们今天就这样，我们就再谢谢徐老师。好，谢谢大家，大家身体健康，谢谢，欢迎，谢谢，欢迎有兴趣来跟我联络。<笑>好，谢谢潘老师，谢谢赖老师，谢谢。OK， 谢,谢。